The third secret of Fatima, the most controversial of the three secrets. Why? Because when the Vatican finally did release it, it was released with some disappointment and a lot of accusations that there's still more to the third secret of Fatima. My co-host Timothy Gordon and I did a video on this topic relating to the smoke of Satan, and we wanted to come back and treat the entire text of the released third secret and also discuss this controversy, which we call the 3A, 3B controversy. That is that there's 3A, something that's revealed, a vision, and then there's text from the Blessed Virgin Mary, a 3B, which explains it as we see in the first secret and the second secret. Timothy, welcome back. Thanks a million. Yeah, so it's for everyone great. tuning in, this is the third part of a trilogy that we're doing. We've already covered the first secret and we've done the second secret. This is now the third video in this series. You'll see up in the right corner the playlist for all of them if you want to get caught up. Of course, this episode stands alone. As always, please subscribe to get notified for future videos. Timothy, uh, before we go through the, th the whole text of the, the released, uh, what we call the 3A, um, let's talk about the background uh, to the anticipation and the final release of this document. There's a lot of people who had seen the third secret and had talked about it going all the way back to when? What, what's our first record of it? Is it Malachi Martin? Or I guess we um, yeah. could say Pius XII is somehow aware of it. Yeah, it depends. It depends how... What, it depends whose words you take. There, there was an interview um, granted to a, a, an emissary sent by Pius the Twelfth, a man named Father Schweigel. We, I, I, it's I've heard different first names on that, but this emissary was sent either in 1951 or 1954. I've heard both both accounts, and and he get was granted a specific interview with Sister Lucy about the third secret. Now, what's, of course, what's, what's difficult in all of this that we treated of the first video, right? And, and we have the commentary on that page to prove it is this is documentary evidence, but it's not, it's not the kind of documentary evidence that we're used to because before we get into the father Schweigel interview, I mean, I think everyone kind of already knows this intuitively, but it shakes out like this. People either accept this or they don't. The camp camp A that, that doesn't accept it says, look, here are three sources that we accept as valid. And of course, we, there's no dispute here from the outset. This this holds for the entire video. It obtains as a truth. But camp B that that seems to offer the evidence that is that there's a chain there that seems to have some legs um, goes back far and can be verified, they are, aren't on that list of, of, of certifiable evidence. So it, it puts you in a weird category when you talk about things like this interview, but, but you have to get comfortable there because it's either true or it's not. There's a lot of evidence. Well, today we'll, we'll talk some about that evidence, why, why you and I believe fervently there's a 3B. And it's not just a function of what, what the CIA started to call, you know, conspiracy theories like the 60s. There's a lot there, um, but it's it's in this middle ground of documentary evidence that, that might be less than perfectly comfortable to accept because it's less mainstream. Whatever, wherever that leaves us. So be it now. Yeah. So this interview, we're going to say it was 1954 with uh, this emissary father Schweigel. He said specifically, this is what I thought was impressive when you designated 3B. There are two parts of the third secret. The first part, he said, concerns the Pope. That's all he said. Then he goes on and he says, the second part, and I must say nothing, to quote him. Yes. The second part. I just want to pause here. We are, our first record of the Fatima third secret includes a first part and a second part. So you know, in, the, in the original uh, Smoke of Satan and third secret, a Fatima video that we did, people were kind of accusing us of like making this up. It's like, yeah, this isn't Gordon and Marshall here bringing the, this is going way back before we right. even born. You know, there's, there's witness of a first part and a second part. And we're calling this three a is the first part. Three B is the second part. Just to get our normal, our nomenclature all tidied up. Right. 
good. Um, yeah. And by the way, before going on, I mean, if people who, who are really newbies to the entire Fatima concept, the Fatima secret concept, the tripartite st- uh, structure of the secret and all that, if they're like, well, why does this only go back to 1954? The answer is, well, even the first two secrets were only published in the middle 40s. And that's when Sister Lucy made the public declaration that this this couldn't, you know, she wasn't really supposed to reveal for the first three decades of the well-known publicly, uh, privately publicly revealed truths of Fatima. So, yeah, it's, it's the middle 40s. And, and we talked about that in the last video, some of the timing there that that might make people look cockeyed at it for a second. But so it's 10 years later that Sister Lucy uh, that is interviewed by Father Schweigel. He says there's two parts. The first part's about the Pope. So, again, we, Antonio Sochi, Chris Ferrara, people like this are not accusing the actual popes of lying unless they're they're adding unnecessary parts into the accusation. Maybe they are. We're, we're not. So Antonio Sochi is not. Um, it, it's not necessary that any of the popes are really, quote unquote, lying. It's yeah. something a little softer. Because when, uh, they, so when the, they do release the third secret, it's about the pope, the vision. We're going to go through it. Right. But then the second part that you're about to explain is absent. Right. It's not there. Right. And so everyone's scratching their head and saying, well, the church released the third secret. They just didn't release the second half of it. Right. Yeah. Precisely. And they even released the second half of it to those with eyes to see in this kind of Straussy and esoteric way. Right. Bit by bit throughout the 70s and 80s. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, in, in a few minutes. But anyway, so he said the second part, I must say nothing. This is the really seems to be the secret part of the secret uh, that's not supposed to be revealed until 1960. Hopefully, I don't want to make all these promises we end up forgetting about, but hopefully we'll talk about the date 1960 itself, uh, at least for 30 seconds or so. Um, it's not, it won't be revealed yet, and this is what heaven actually wants me to be careful about. But um, it involves that crucial line of text in, involving Portugal. The dogma of the faith will always be preserved in Portugal, etc. Meaning more text to follow. Yeah, dot, dot, so, dot. dot, dot, dot. So it involves doctrine, dogma, and dangers to it. That's yeah. that is uh, in Portugal. In Portugal will be, but everywhere else, the dogma will be endangered, jeopardized, and probably profaned, attacked. Um, that's that's almost as good as uh, uh, an automatic assumption and in, in inference. That's not uh, even what we'd call a reasonable guess. Excellent. So we're moving through time, and we have people. Once we get, well, should we go to 1960? I think we should. Yeah, yeah, just because I promised. That gets us to to Malachi Martin. So One thing, one thing, do you mind? So for the people that are balking at the idea of... uh, We should just say, we should just say, the great majority of cardinals, bishops, priests, professional Catholics, all say this is bogus. They say, look, Third Secret was released. Um, We know it. It's already been fulfilled. It's completed. Let's move on in the church. Fatima is a closed book. Nothing to see here. There's a whole other, for people who are new, there's a whole other viewpoint that says, no, Fatima is still very much in play. We haven't yet. First of all, we have denial of hell. That's First Secret. Russia has not yet been fully consecrated, which you and I covered in our previous video. It's still a major thing. Russia is still a major thing. And this idea of a suffering pope and a city in ruins and all the things we're about to cover today, that's all still to come. Whereas right. the other camp says, well, John Paul II got shot. And so that's kind of the fulfillment of everything. And people say, no, not, not really. Not so much. Just to kind right. of frame everything, you know. And no, that's helpful. I've that's been shocked too, Timothy, because there's been a lot of Protestants who are watching our videos on this and they're hearing all this for the first time. And some of them are like, wow. Some of them are like, what? You know, fill, fill in some of this stuff for us. So I kind of feel like we need to kind of make these pauses and explain no, it's good. how this is situated yeah. because if you're brand new to this, it can, it can seem a little bit 
odd or esoteric. Yeah. Or when you, if you're brand new to it, you, it, it, like you just said, you're not quite sure what's disputed, what's beyond dispute, right? Like right. the third secret, 70,000. I, I mean, the, the content of the, the promised miracle, 70,000 people witnessed it. You have to be a, a crackpot wearing a tinfoil hat to deny it, not to believe it. So that's, that's well established on the other hand. And, and so is the first and the second secret that's well established. Um, the third secret is where, where people are having bitter disputes and you don't even know how to pull the wheat from the shelf. If you're just hearing about Fatima itself, it's a big topic. It's like the most interesting thing that's happened in, in a thousand years. And, and it's, it's well verified. It's not, it's not for crackpots. Only the third secret is for quote unquote crackpots, but not really. But also in 1917, why weren't any of the secrets revealed? Because they were intended to remain esoteric, covered, hidden for at least a little bit of time. And um, it's so the first real mention of them, just because you wanted to go do a documentary chronology, is actually, I believe, to the mayor of Urum, who is a Freemason, who kidnapped the three kids. It's actually why they missed the, uh, One the meeting with yeah. Our Lady. Yeah, yeah it, it, they missed the August 13th meeting with Our Lady. It was on the 13th of every month. I guess that was their uh, fourth meeting with her. And they ended up meeting with her August 19th, 1917. Why? Because he'd kidnapped them for, for a week. And he was yeah. trying to figure out what were the three secrets. And he was, he, was a, he was a Freemason. He was threatening to boil them all in oil. This is also very, very strong evidence of the veracity of Fatima writ large, every aspect of it, because yeah. these were a six, a seven, and a nine-year-old. Yeah, I mean, think about why like, would the local mayor kidnap a couple of kids? Right. It's a big deal. Okay. Something's going on. Yeah. Oh, a couple crackpot kids that are telling yeah. wild stories. Who care? Why would right. a, the a, mayor? A, a, yeah, it's, it's too much. But they did mention a secret. There is strong insinuation that it's tri- uh, multi-part. So that goes all the way back to 1917. Middle 40s, I believe 1940 or something is the first year of the specific mention of parts one and two. And then a decade later, 1954, this interview of Father Schweigel. Now you want to go to 1960, go we shall. Uh, yeah. 1960 was supposed to be the big reveal date. Um, and this is one of the first controverted aspects, uh, meaning there's this bitter struggle between Faithful Catholics and faithful Catholics on this uh, on this point, because I, I, I put it this way. Um, the dispute comes down to whether or not it was Our Lady herself that had had dictated the year 1960 for the reveal of the third part of the secret. And the that the anti Fatimites, faithful Catholics, good Catholics that that are are our friends in many ways um, that just haven't been convinced yet. People like um, Catholic answers, good, good people, just not convinced. They say they base, they're almost forced into the position of saying that the year 1960 was neither heaven nor our ladies. Right. It was Lucy's dicta. Yeah. It was Lucy's because, because how could the church, how could Pope John the 23rd disobey this? Well, we, we know, there, there is an answer to this. John the 23rd did not like Fatima. He was very yeah. anti Fatima. He didn't even seem to like the three kids um, when you look at the, the epistolary evidence. But so can, do you want to talk a little bit about the implications of, of um, 1960? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote an article several years ago that, that talked about the, the tension in the Catholic church between the visionary and the hierarch. And it really goes all the way back to Easter Sunday, when you have Mary Magdalene, who's the first to see the resurrected Christ in the gospel accounts. And then, you know, she goes to the apostles and they're not so sure about that. Right. So there's going back to the resurrection of our Lord. We have visionaries, often female who have experiences. They report it to the bishops, to the hierarchy, the successors of the apostles or the apostles themselves in the case of the resurrection. And they're like, "Eh, not so sure. And it's not always female, like our Lady Guadalupe, it's Juan Diego, he's a peasant man. But it's usually the humble, right? Not people, you know, it's not scientists or theologians, it's, you know, peasants and little girls and women and nuns like St. Faustina. 
And even in the case of St. Faustina, you know, like her books put on the index, you know, Cardinal Attiavani kind of basically says, no, this isn't orthodox. So there's always this really? tension. Yeah, for a moment. Yeah, he, he was not a big fan of, of St. Faustina's diary. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, one little blemish on him, you know. So this is always kind of happening in the church. And, I, and it seems to be something that our Lord uh, delights in and plans in, that he sets it up this way. You, know, you mean he, the surprises of the Holy Spirit, yeah, right? Yeah, these surprises yeah. of the Holy Spirit, yeah. if you want to call them yeah. that. Um, where he chooses someone unlikely to be the first herald of something, and then it's yeah. contested by those who are really in charge, the ordained. Yeah. And then the ordained have the moment of clarity, and they come around like like the appointed bishop-elect in the story of Our Lady Guadalupe. The roses come down, the tilma is revealed, and he's like, wow, this is really Our Lady, and we have an approved apparition. Similar with the, you know, with the bishop in Portugal and this whole story as well. So the fact that there is tension and doubt on the part of certain clerics, even a pope, doesn't make it go away and it, it doesn't discredit it. That's you know, right. That's, that's good to get out there. You know, yeah. even when, when Mary Magdalene goes to the apostles, Peter and John run to the tomb. John gets there first. Peter goes in. I mean, Peter kind of like, he doesn't just believe it on faith alone. He wants to check out, you know, check it out. So right. here we have a, a Pope, John the 23rd, who is skeptical. And we have to just kind of go back in time and think this is, we're getting out of the 1950s. We're moving in the 1960s. Everything's changing in the world. You know, before a hundred mm -hmm. years before that, everybody still warmed themselves with fire. Right. <laughs> with right. coal. You know, yeah, this is just a like they did. It's just a like pre-penicillin world. Yes. You know? They didn't have, they, they didn't know what to do with the infection. Right. And now we're moving into the 60s and he wants to update the church. Right. He wants to open the windows and, and uh, make everything, you know, for the modern man. We've talked about this in a lot of other videos. And so having this, you know, vision from 1917 and these three little kids and this nun, this Carmelite nun yeah. from Portugal trying to tell him what to do. Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, he's got big yeah. plans. So he, <laughs> he basically brings everybody together in 1960. And the story is there's two Portuguese translators. Malachi Martin says that they are Portuguese seminarians from seminarians there in Rome. And John Paul, or sorry, John the 23rd. And Malachi Martin says Cardinal Bea, who is Malachi Martin's superior, his boss. So Malachi right. Martin works for Cardinal Bea. Bea is Jesuit, right? I, I believe Bea is. Uh, Malachi Martin was. So yeah. I think he has to be. Yeah, I believe he is. Yeah, he's Jesuit. Cardinal Bea is Jesuit. And they're there to read, to open the envelope and read the third secret in, I'm assuming this is 1960. The account I've read doesn't actually date it, but I mean, are, do you know anything it's about that? Be. Yeah, I'm thinking it's 1960. Well, the Vatican only, so, so the, the timeline splices the 1954 Schweigel interview and the 1960 uh, uh, ostensible reading. reveal. Yeah, yeah. I think the reading did take place in early 60. The Vatican only received the two envelopes. Uh, we know the exact dates of the respective two envelopes arriving uh, because the two, the two parts of the third secret actually arrived in uh, separate times in late 58 or early 59. Uh, I forget, but except, and they were stored in two different places. They were stored in, a, um, one was stored in a wooden safe called Barbarigo in the papal apartments. The other one was stored in, uh, in the Vatican archives. And so, yeah, so it had only been there. The, these secrets had not been sent in 1917 or in the forties or fifties. They were sent, I mean, in the very, very late fifties and I think 1958. So yes, the, the Portuguese reading happened in uh, real time. Yeah, the John Portuguese 23rd is Pope in 58. So, yeah, it's within 58 to 60, but everybody seems to associate this with 1960. The it year, is, I think. Yeah, the That's year. what I've heard. Yeah. yeah. Just the source I was reading doesn't specify this is in 1960. Malachi Martin, from what I can tell, doesn't specify 1960. I, I just want to be as precise as possible. Right. Um, right. But anyway, Malachi Martin, he says this, quote, I cooled my heels in the corridor outside the Holy Father's apartment. So they're in the Apostolic Palace. Right. While my boss, Cardinal Bea, was inside debating with the Holy Father, 
and with a group of other bishops and priests and two young Portuguese seminarians who translated the letter, a single page written in Portuguese for all those in the room. So there it is. Nice. Nice. And that, that and that, that will be, uh, so it's two and a half years after it arrives. Sorry, I'd misspoken. The, the, the first sealed envelope arrived at the Vatican on April 16, 1957, a year earlier okay. than I thought. So under was, Pius the 12th. Yes. It was placed in the office of Pope Pius the 12th in a little chest called Barbarigo. It doesn't say that here. Uh, bearing the note secret of the Holy office, which is what they used to call the CDF. Uh, but it appears that Pope Pius XII did not at the time read the secret. According to Cardinal Ottaviani, who I, I wanted to address, and Monsignor Capovia, who would become the personal secretary to John XXIII in the following year. Um, when Pope John XXIII opened it in 1959, according to this account, okay. one year after the death of Pius XII, um, um, it was because Pope Pius XII had apparently decided to wait until 1960, following the the uh, heavenly dicta. He died in blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah. So according to Ottaviani and in Capovilla, the secretary of John the Twenty Third, the envelope was still sealed when John the Twenty Third opened it in 1959. Meaning, yeah, that so so Pius XII had not opened it, which is remarkable. That how could you not? And Pius the Twelfth seemed to like Fatima yeah, and be interested Fatima. in it. He, he wasn't. He wasn't John the Twenty Third. This is the, you have the historical kind of irony, the oddness of history. That John the Twenty Third, who was always a skeptic, even even speaks about the seers themselves as uh, harbingers of doom in one private letter. He doesn't like them. He wants to, the church to be nicey nicey, puppy dogs and rainbows. Vatican Two. Everything's great. Hooray for everything. And and Pius the Twelfth is much more, I think, a realist, his feet firmly planted on the ground, knowing that that's a lot of bad things are happening. And one is op- ends up opening the the letter containing the secret that says precisely the opposite. Right. Negative doom and gloom, hellfire, literally. And Russia, whatever, you know, whatever they made of that in the 50s. And the other one who you'd expect to be more comfortable, less discomfiture with the secret itself actually didn't open it. So that's that's strange. There's the other um, thing that when you mentioned Cardinal Ottaviani, I wanted to, to mention Dr. Marshall. It's this. He is he come 1960 when the secret was not opened. This is not just a Catholic um um, sort of celebrated cause. It was global. It was celebrated in the worldwide press. So New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, London Observer were arguably the four most important English speaking newspapers, at least at the time. Uh, they all wrote outrage pieces. We've been waiting for this for 1960. And Cardinal Ottaviani, for one, um, went on record saying, and again, he's generally considered one of the few conservatives in the Curia at this point, um, in the, the John the 23rd Curia. He said, it is at the bottom of a pile in the Holy Office, and there it should probably forever stay. So Cardinal Taviani was not necessarily a fan of releasing it. You, you can't assume that, that just the conservatives in the church wanted it revealed and the liberals didn't even though that's that's the basic way that it, it the logic shakes out um so yeah. that's important i never know I, what to make of that you know i wonder you know was Ativani was he in the room when cardinal Bea was there i don't know it says there's a group of bishops in there i think you'd want some theologians in there and he says they were yeah. debating with the holy father or Bea was debating with the holy father um so there is some debate you know, yeah. they read it and I'm sure they're debating. I'm just guessing, is this true? Right. And then the next question is whether it's true or not. Should we even release it to the public? Right. What, what's the New York Times going to say when it gets a hold of this? Right. And, and, and is it embarrassing to the papacy or to the church? You know, it's either it's either apocalyptic and causes everybody to be afraid or it's very embarrassing to the church. I can't think of another reason 
why you wouldn't yeah. release it. Yeah, agreed. Um, and, and so there was an anonymous release in the spring of 1960 that uh, was done by the Vatican press office that said it will probably it, it went to the effect of this. It'll the, the third secret of Fatima will probably never be revealed, which they quickly kind of kind of moved away from. And they said, well, that was anonymous. We're not sure who did it They're, They start from like 1961 on. All of when, when they released this statement, I, I've I've had a I've had a look at it. There are pictures of it online. You can go just Vatican uh, a statement, anonymous statement saying no release of Fatima secret or whatever you would Google. You can look at the document itself. They basically threw that under the bus, disowned it, and and repudiated the logic of it, saying no, we're not we're not promising we're never going to release that. We don't, we don't know who released this statement to the press because that obviously increased the, the, you know, the barking more of the papers that had already the, the worldwide press who had already been howling for the release of the secret, um, come 1960 without a release. So the, it's safe to say, all this goes to say that the, the members of the Curia themselves did not know what to do with this. They didn't know how to spin it. They didn't know how to play it. They didn't know how to quote get in front of the story. But like you said, for, it's basically one of those two reasons. If if you have half a brain, it boils down to those two things that you just said. Um, it must be the the um, adverse incentivization not to release. And they were evidently going back and forth. There were hot you know, debates like that between Cardinal Bea and the other people. They had translators lined up, you know, you know, because not all those guys spoke Portuguese, but they were ready to go. And and it was not clear to anyone in the Curia, what do we do with this message from heaven? It's it's it, it had to be difficult, particularly to a pope like John the twenty third, that yeah, he's preparing he, he, Vatican II, man. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. He's saying, "Hey, we got to get Vatican II. We got to get these documents ready. Got to get bishops in town. I don't want to have this negative harbinger of doom note released right. to the New York Times. I want the New York Times to have Vatican II, right? And Vatican II is going to be sweepingly optimistic, you know, pro to the extent that we can say this in a way, pro ecumenical, pro world." In yeah. a way that the Council of Trent was not, it was anti-worldly. The Vatican II is supposed to open the doors and the window to the, the church and, and make it more amenable to the world, whatever that means. You know, we can right. debate that for hours um, and, yeah. and still not know what and, it meant. And in a few moments, we're going to go through the whole text of the release third secret. And you're going to see, yeah, it doesn't really have that vision. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's pretty pessimistic. Yeah. It's yeah. sorrowful. It's really, it's a sorrowful vision. So before we do that, though, I think we should say something about Cardinal Ratzinger and his comments on the third secret, because everybody knows Cardinal Ratzinger. He's Pope Ben the 16th. Uh, most people trust Cardinal Ratzinger. Um, he definitely twists everything up by resigning from the papacy. But he speaks of the content of the third secret all the way back to 1984. So 16 yep. years before the release and what he says about it doesn't seem to match fully what's released. Is there anything you want to more say on Ratzinger's comment on the third secret? Without a doubt. I mean, when, when I've debated this with, with close friends who are not quite convinced and they say, aren't you wearing a tinfoil hat? Isn't this a bit crazy? You know, listen to the the extreme arguments of some of the Fatimists, you know, are the, they're saying they're two sister Lucy's. That's easier to characterize as as yeah. wackadoodle. And people have asked but, us in the but, comments, do you believe in the two sister Lucy's? I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't. Whack. Look, look, he, this is what I, I think. people needed. are. It's not needed. It's it, Occam's razor. It's extra it's superfluous. Could that have happened? I guess. But it, yeah. it's one you have to understand when you start talking like that. Yeah. I, I don't know why a certain personality type, the certain argument temperament is, is doesn't mind. The, 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 the Vatican set up a fake imposter nun, adult Sister Lucia, to say what the church wanted her to say, and that the real one was either killed or imprisoned somewhere. Right. It's not necessary. Killed, imprisoned. Now, now 
now. The, t- t- so that because they're going to we're going to be have at least a few people barking at us for for mocking this idea right now. Yeah. Sister Lucy was placed under essentially lock and key by John the 23rd. That's not we're, we're mocking the idea that they killed her and came up with a, a fake Lucy. Yes, she was basically put under absolute seal, as it were, um, um, in the in the uh, convent by Pope John the 23rd. And there is evidence that she, when she heard of the election of John the 23rd in 1958, she, this demure little 40 year old nun at that point, 40, uh, I'm sorry, 50 year old nun at that point, who'd never spoken out, was wanting to take drastic steps. There's, there's a story that she did want to get on the radio and release it to the world as soon as John the 23rd was elected. She seemed to have strong um, uh, she seemed to have compelling evidence that that he would not be a friend to the message of Fatima. Whatever, whatever you think about John the Twenty Third. Now, uh, yeah, I was making another point. What was it? So, oh, Ratzinger. The, I, we were talking about Ratzinger. I think, I think this the Ratzinger evidence and JP two in between nineteen sixty the non reveal and two thousand the par- partial reveal. I I think this is. You have the best circumstantial, uh, strongest evidence in the entire case is what Ratzinger and JP2 were saying about the third secret before the partial release. And, and here's why, because they're characterizing it. They're characterizing it in a way that is flat, uh, inconcomitant, or what we would say at law, not apposite with the, the 3A. It, it, you don't get it in 3A. And this is essentially what Ratzinger said. He said in a November 1984 interview with uh, Jesu magazine, uh, translated Jesus magazine, that the third secret involved the novissimi, which is the four final things. And it involved the dangers not only to the world, but to the church, which, which you, could, you, could, you could get that out of 3A a little bit. But the way he talks about the novissimi as related to the dangers to the church and the world, it simply doesn't jive with, it's not a posit with the really florid kind of imagery um, in the ultimate secret. Um, yeah. Also, I think it's shortly before its release, either in the late 90s or in, two, in early 2000 itself, before the reveal, a John Paul II gave a speech in Fatima. He went to Fatima and gave this speech. And guess what he was saying? He was saying the third secret, when it's eventually revealed, when it's shortly revealed, it concerns the 12th book of Revelation. The dragon falling from heaven. Maybe, maybe you could uh, extrapolate yeah, so on Revelation that. Revelation so. twelve. It begins with the sign of of the woman clothed in the, <laughs> in the sun. She has twelve stars around her head. She's with child. She groans in labor pains, and then the the dragon appears, multi headed, and he waits uh, before her, waiting for the child to be born. He tries to eat the child, consume the child. Saint Michael shows up. There's a battle, and this dragon sweeps a third of the stars from heaven. And then, of course, he is defeated, and God protects the woman, uh, takes her to a place of safety. I think it's for 1,260 days, and that's Revelation 12. So the idea here is there's a war in heaven, Lucifer, Satan, the dragon is there, and then there's this element of him sweeping the third of the stars, which is seen by all Catholic theologians as a fall of the third of the angels, primordial, primordial fall of the angelic hosts, a third of them becoming demonic. However, there have been medieval commentators who have also seen the, the, the angels and the stars as a allegory for the clergy. Right. So some have stated that in the end times, a third of the clergy will fall to Lucifer's tail, will be swept down just like the angels. Um, Only a third, eh? Yeah, Only a that's, third. Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's not that's not dark news. That's yeah. great news by our standards. Exactly. Right? Uh, another thing Ratzinger said, he says, um, if it is not made public, that is a third secret, at least for the time being, it is in order to prevent religious prophecy from being mistaken for right. a quest for the sensational. So Ratzinger 
is saying in 1984 that the reason it hasn't been released, according to him, the CDF, is that it's since it could be spun as very sensational. Right. Which, which the part three, a part, I guess could it's pretty be sensational. A, it's, it's pretty sensational, but it's not so, I mean, it's not like you get up to the podium to read the third secret and you're like, we look, we can't do this. Someone, uh, I mean, you know, this is why it'll be helpful to actually um, have on record a reading of the third secret in a moment. And then people can, people can judge for themselves. Um, what, what John Venery, who was, was a fatimist who was friends with uh, uh, father Gruner before he died uh, a year and a half ago, uh, heaven rest his soul. He's a good man. What he would do habitually, I think I said this in the other video, he would read uh, some sort of account of what happened to JP two on May 13th, 1981 when he was shot. And then back to back with it, he would read the third secret a three a as revealed and just be quiet. And the room would erupt into laughter. So it's yes, they revealed the real secret, the, the fit of the third three a, you know, the part that was re truthfully revealed by the Vatican does not the application of the the secret to the facts of John Paul II's shooting is not doctrine. You don't even have to accept that it's that. It's primarily the the uh, guesswork or the patchwork or the brainwork of two cardinals, Bertoni and Sedano, who, like drumroll please, have both been implicated um, by. Uh, sexual our Archbishop scandals. Vigano, yeah. sexual Archbishop scandals Vigano. by Vigano. And we yeah. have, <laughs> Tim and I have tons of videos on Vigano. Like 80. We, yeah. yeah, we have yeah. like the top videos on YouTube on Vigano. Just Google Vigano, you're going to get our, our videos on it. Another thing that, that we didn't mention before, I believe, is that those guys are implicated in Maciel Maciel, the Legionaries right. of Christ scandal. So these guys have a lot of tar on them. So, yeah. So if you want to talk about uh, credibility and credulity. Yeah. Uh, you know, the You're subject telling me of the guys who were telling me how to read Fatima, or the guys who covered for Father Maciel Maciel. No, thanks. I'll pass. Right. My favorite Fatima scholar, the guy who set out to debunk the Fatima myth. He was in the mainstream was is Antonio Sochi. He was best friends, not only with Cardinal Ratzinger. He did not lose his friendship over his book, The Fourth Secret. He wasn't best friends with him, but he was friends with him. He was best friends with Cardinal Bertoni, who with whom he broke. He lost his friendship um, after he published the book because he was like, look, I did the research. I was originally on your side. This is crazy wrong. And Cardinal Bertoni would refuse to this day. I mean, Cardinal Bertoni, if you're out there listening, if you if you're a, if you're a Marshall show fan, please yeah, go and do some sort of talk or debate or appearance with your old friend Sochi. He will not. He refuses to be cornered by him because Sochi's yeah. like, look, let's just talk about this in public. I want people to see the truth of the two positions here. What one one final thing, probably before we go into the secret, uh, the secrets text itself is this. And I know we hit this hard in the last video, but um, I, it's too too prominent a point to skip. The there are several references by JP2, by Ratzinger, and even by members of the Curia after the secret was revealed impartially, uh, uh, partially in the year 2000 that refer to the words of the Virgin, which makes sense, right? It's it's the secret from the Virgin. So why would we not, you know, why would we not talk about her words? Yeah, I mean, what well, it, what first secret had a vision and then Mary explained it with her words and. The second secret had a vision, and then she explained it with her words. And then the third secret has a vision, and then Mary doesn't say anything and goes back to heaven. We have no idea what it means. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right, right. It, particularly when the, the, the first interior secret logic is of the three secrets demands that Our Lady would say, now, as she says in the first secret, you saw a vision of hell. Let me tell you about that, children. Right. The most complicated vision is the bishop in white going up a hill, getting killed by bullets and arrows. We're going to go through all that in a second. And then our lady doesn't tell us city. what it means. Yeah. Get out of town. Get out of town. And we, oh, well, so that's, yeah. I mean, 
Sister Lucy herself in her third memoir um, tells us, and again, we've talked about this before, that she could see, hear, and speak with Our Lady. Her, her little cousin, Jacinta, could only see and hear Our Lady, couldn't speak. Francisco, the little rapscallion, who's now a saint, so I, I don't know if you can call a saint a rapscallion. I've done it before, but um, uh, no comment. But, but he could only see Our Lady. He couldn't hear her or speak. So of these three senses, you have Lucy having all three, Jacinta having two, Francisco having only one, right. bearing only one uh, uh, capacity. She says specifically that she had to ask Our Lady about the third secret. Is it okay if I share your words, your words with Francisco regarding the third secret? And Our Lady said, you can go ahead and tell, tell, tell the little Dickens. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Which and implies so that she has there words. It is. Yeah. There's words. That's that's a done deal. Unless yep. Sister Lucy's lying in her third third memoir. Uh, also, did you? I don't know. I I'm always confused by the uh, the words of you know regarding Portugal and the dogma of the faith. Do you know anything about that? that yeah, I mean, that it's just that. And, yeah, I mean, it says that the third secret begins with the words. In Portugal, the dogma of faith will always be preserved, etc. So before 2000, everybody assumed that when the third secret was revealed, it would begin with Our Lady saying, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. But, 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 right. but. What was released in 2000 nowhere contains those words. So again, this appeals to the idea going all the way back to the 40s that the third secret of Fatima has two parts. The right. first is a vision. The second is words of Our Lady, which Our Lady somewhere in, in that text, presumably at the beginning, says, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. Which also props up the theory that is somewhat ameliorative to the popes between then and now, that, look, they weren't trying to be outright liars. They were actually trying to uh, put enough flags out there for those with eyes to see. They, for whatever reason, they might not have wanted to to write it large, but except they were trying to put out there, look, anyone that studied Fatima for three hours or more for, for 30 minutes or more yeah. knows that the third secret contains at least this one line. The et cetera means there's much more text to follow. But those are words of the right. virgins. Right. We're going to make it super obvious for anyone with three quarters of a brain that this is not the full secret. What we reveal in, in 2000. They again, the other side of this, the 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 countervailing side, good people, faithful Catholics, friends like Catholic answers, they'll never deal with this. Right. What, what right. about what about well, the and there's Portugal a reason line? for that? Uh, there's a reason for that. And that is it refers to dogma being preserved. And right. what have we seen for the past 60 years? We've seen an erosion of dogma doctrine. We've seen the almost complete collapse of Catholicism in Europe. Yeah, yeah. We've seen a decline in religious vocations for, for women. We've seen a decline in baptisms. We've seen a decline in church weddings. We've seen an, a decline in seminaries. We've seen, it's a decline everywhere. And I'm not making this up. I'm not being a pessimist. I'm just saying, look, here's the facts. It's a realist position. Um, Europe and other parts of the West uh, the dogma of the faith has not been preserved. And we have cardinals and bishops and priests, as we've been covering in videos not relating to Fatima, who are really off the chain, not just theologically, but morally. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, Cardinal McCarrick was sleeping with his seminarians, generations of them, if Vegan knows to be interested. But, you know, Cardinal McCarrick has some bad theology, too. Right. What was being bit. told in the confessionals when he was he hearing confessions regarding the sixth commandment? If you think he was at the beach house on the weekend doing bad things, that he was giving sound moral advice to men and women in the confessional? No. What about his sermons? No. What about his policies in China? No. All this is bad, rotten fruit. And right. so the really, I think the embarrassing thing for Holy Mother Church or for the Vatican in particular is to deal with this idea that the Blessed Virgin Mary, Theotokos, Mother of our Lord, 
has critical things to say about the preservation of dogma, a word we don't want to talk about dogma. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and it, that it would have, I mean, the idea about the preservation of dogma and doctrine is that it would come, it would be more relevant when asked why, why wait until 1960 for the reveal? She said, th- this is also one of the strongest circumstantial reasons to believe that there's a three B she said, because in 1960, it will be more clear it being the purpose of the release of the secret and the purpose, the existential purpose for the secret itself. It will be more clear, meaning what did we know was coming in 1960? And I'm I'm not saying uh, this isn't, this doesn't really boil down to, you know, um, uh, an attack on any of the doctrine we got at Vatican II, because right. we didn't get any doctrine at Vatican but II. It, it was a pastoral council, yeah, but, but we knew about it. It was announced in 1959. Exactly. And sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, neither you nor me reject the Second Vatican Council per se. No. Nope. But I think you and I certainly agree with hundreds of others, including men like Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict the Sixteenth Emeritus. Uh, Vatican II had caused a lot of problems in the church, you know, right. and when you write a document that is truthful, but it's equivocal and it's not clear, you give ammunition to heretics and to liberals who are going to undermine the faith, undermine the doctrine. And that's the spirit of Vatican II that's been haunting the church for all these decades now. So right. I, I want to move Can on. We- to the, I, I think we're going to run out of time. So I want to make sure that we get to the actual text before we do just one last point in this, and that is, we forgot to say that Ratzinger in that interview says that the message, the third secret of Fatima is essentially the same as Our Lady of Akita. Right, which has become disputed since then, but he told Bishop Ito of the Philippines Oh, that's right, it wasn't in the interview. Akita. It was not in the interview, yeah. It, was it wasn't the, in that interview. He told Bishop ambassador. Ito that. uh, Bishop Ito, unless you call him a liar, everyone says he's a very good man. Again, it's it's almost like a Vigano thing. Other people rushed in. And after he told Ito this, I think in the early 80s, it was near that interview uh, chronologically. Um, It might have been late 70s, right after Akita had happened. But he said, yes, the, the the third secret of Fatima and the message at Akita, which is wild, a wild message. Yeah, let me read one line on it. Akita, Our Lady of Akita, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops, churches and altars sacked. That's Our Lady of Akita. We haven't seen any of that, have we? Churches no. and altars sacked. Yeah, yeah. but what, what, the 10 seconds, 10 seconds. I have to say this or I'll, I'll, I won't forgive myself. I, I know you want to, let's, let's move in that direction. But regarding Vatican II, because we're going to have people if you don't believe me, look at the commentary people barking at us from either direction. This is yes. when you get that crossfire, you're either very wrong or very right. We're going to get people barking at us as we did in the last um, the, the first Vatima uh, uh, video that we did saying, oh, how do you how do you say all this and not be against the message of Vatican II? It's like, well, it wasn't a doctrinal council. But and then we'll also get people barking at us saying you guys aren't faithful sons of the church. Look. The, in technology, we know there's something called uh, planned obsolescence, right? It's wired into your Nintendo to go haywire in a few years, so you got to buy another one. They really do do that. That's not just wild conspiracy theories. Well, at, at Vatican II, there's tons of evidence that there was something like a, a, a programmed ambiguity that would allow pastorally, through the pastoral means, which even makes its way into the language, Precisely what followed the spirit of of uh, yeah. Vatican II. Ross Ross Duthit, uh from New York Times actually has is the best public voice I think on Vatican uh, on uh, Vatican II. So this is what we're saying, and this seems to be the purpose of the third secret. It will be more relevant in when revealed in 1960. Well, uh, John the 23rd had just the prior year in 59 announced that he was going to do this Vatican II, and he denounced his intent for it. Yep. That simply doesn't make any sense that, that the third secret, the assertion that the third secret will have more uh, uh, automatic relevance to the common mind in 1959 or 1960 
um, if the only secret that we could receive as the third secret is 3A? How would you know about the Pope being shot in 1981? Right. In 1960. It's it's a slam dunk. Yeah. Really. Doesn't Think about sense. that. Doesn't make sense. All right. I had to get that in. Sorry. Good. OK, so we're going to cover the text now. It's pretty short. It's basically one paragraph. Um, this was uh, revealed to uh, Sister Lucia, July 13th, 1917. And it begins this way. Of course, Tim, jump in at any moment if you want to say say something on it. She yeah. says, quote, I write in obedience to you, my God who command me to do so through his excellency, the Bishop of Lara, Laria? Lara, Lara, yeah. Lara. And through your most holy mother and mine. After the two parts, which I have already explained, and just for those who, who are very strict, there's technically one secret of Fatima in three parts. We've been just kind of using the offhand first secret, second secret, third secret. It's easier to do that. But technically it's one secret with three parts. So there's a unity to these three. Right? right. They're not disconnected. So I just want to emphasize that after the two parts, which are, which I have already explained uh, at the left of our lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire, but they died out in contact with the splendor that our lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. All right, I'll stop there. Just a couple of quick observations. Um, she sees this to the left of Our Lady. And I was thinking about that. Why is that? Well, she sits, according to the Assumption of Mary, she sits at the right hand of Jesus. So that means who's at her left? Jesus. Jesus. Our Lord. Yeah. So it's interesting that this vision occurs to the left of Our Lady. It's almost like happening in the space where our Lord would be, right? So right. we're looking into the divine essence through the humanity of Jesus. That's my take on it. That's why it's, it's a little to the left of Our Lady. She says, a little to the left and a little above, right? So mm -hmm. this is where Christ would be enthroned in heaven. All right, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Again, sinister. It's on the left side for the angel. So... There's something important here about the left. And where was the last time we saw an angel with a flaming sword? Genesis. Yeah. yeah. This is when Adam and Eve were kicked out. We now have the new Eve, Mary. And we see again the angel with the left sword. As one of my kids said, this is the first appearance of light of uh, lightsabers in human right. history. Right? <laughs> flaming Tweet. swords. Yeah. It's, it's giving out flames and... There's a splendor from Our Lady from her right hand. So we have this left and right thing happening. From her right hand, this radiation that comes from her is, is kind of killing the flames of the sword. So this angel is bringing judgment, but her mercy is sort of, uh, what's the right word? Extinguishing it. Right. Um, and then pointing with his right hand. So now we have his right hand brought in. He cries out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. So it's like the left hand is judgment for the angel, the sword, and the right hand is actually salvation. Penance, penance, penance. Right. So that's kind of how I'm reading the first sentence here is the left and the right um, with Our Lady and with the angel kind of, you know, destruction, but also salvation with the right hand. Jump in and share anything else that comes to mind. Well, I mean... Yeah, and this is the least sensational aspect. This is the introduction to the, the third part of the secret. And already, this is not of a piece with the the tonal directional shift that Pope John the Twenty Third wants to make, is it? Penance, penance, penance. I mean, John the Twenty Third's entire pontificate is is um, summarized by the idea that we we've talked that's old, you know, right. talking about penance and sin. That's 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 the old church. Yeah, the fast, modern fasting, hair shirts, monasteries, yeah, hair, hair shirts. Yeah, yeah. yeah itch, Pilgrimages. Itchy, yeah. That's that's the look. Look, bro. This is this is John the twenty third for a second. Sorry, sorry. You say look, bro. Is that what he said? Look, bro. He said this in his yeah. writings. He's like, <laughs> look, bro. Fra. The world. Look, bro. The world doesn't want hair shirts and penance and all of this. Uh, uh, these mac Light machinations sabers. from the pro. Yeah. The world might want that, but only in terms of entertainment, right? right we yeah. want to see Darth Maul versus Qui-Gon Jinn. Like that, 
He, yeah. he, the world doesn't want this. And it's to Pope John the 23rd. It was very important to be cool with the world. That that was his project. Uh, it was not penance. I don't care if you're yeah, the biggest John the 23rd fan. In our first video, Our Lady in Fatima leads with hell. She's like, hey, kids, right. there's hell. People falling into it like snowflakes. Y- you know, we kind of think children's church, you don't talk about hell. You know, children's church is like happy and you like fold paper and do crafts. You don't mm-hmm. say, you know, the, the teachers and come like, hey, kids, let's look at a movie about hell. Where parents, most parents, of you are going. Yeah, yeah, parents, yeah, parents yeah. aren't going to pull their kid out of that daycare, that kindergarten. Yeah. But Our Lady appears in 1917 and says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a secret. It has three parts. First part, hell. Right. Uh, I mean, exactly. The, this is what when John the 23rd said, I want to make I want to bring the church into the modern world. What ended up happening was this tremendous castration slash suburbanization of the world where you wind up with 40 years later, just this sissy, toothless, gutless, heartless uh, rendition of what the church will teach kids in, you know, Sunday school. RCIA programs, you know, which is adults, everyone, you know, pulpit homiletics, all that you end up getting is this boring, wishy-washy, white bread, toothless right. teaching of, of suburbanized, you know, happy Jesus. And that's not only the boringest and, and the least compelling like concept I've ever heard, you know, but it, it makes atheists of people. Not only does it make people hard hearted meaning unrepentant in their sin to stop talking about sin and penance, which the angel and Mary did. But it also is, and this is the important aspect. It's prima facie. It's not believable. If there's a God, he has standards for us. And the church held to that for 1900 some odd years, but we've been off board that for a while. And and we know in the pit of our guts, that's wrong. That's right. And so, so penance, penance, penance means everything Jesus said. Jesus was, a prophet, I think, yeah. more often than he was a, a priest or a king, and he sounded a lot like his cousin John the Baptist. Yeah, in the public ministry, he he's a prophet. Yeah, he's he's prophesying, and it's repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, repent. It's, and by the way, the gospels call that the gospel, the evangelium. That's the good news, right? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> that's right. Good news. The, good, the good news is that you can wear a hair shirt. Right. Or you can do a bread and water fast for a week and get your your baguettes out of trouble. Right. Yeah. It's the good news is not that you get out of trouble and we have a reasonable hope that that hell is empty. that no one's in hell and that it's empty and God created it knowing that. No, the good news is, look, most people find the broad path to hell. If you find the narrow path to heaven. Uh, dash Jesus. Right. Jesus of Nazareth said that yeah, but, strive to enter therein. Strive. Strive, meaning yeah. you got to try hard. The good news is I'm giving you all the tools, the sacraments, the grace my that mother. you need to get there. My yeah. mother, Fatima in like 1917 yeah. years, penance. So, so that's the good news. The good news is not that the good news is if you work hard, you, you can succeed. I'm giving you the tools. The, the good news is not that you don't have to try. So right. that, that's, I think, that's what I pull out of and, that. And that's by the way, picture. And by the way, we're not discounting that we have faith, that this is 100% gratuitous, right? Grace is operative in us, right? So we're not saying, hey, you, everybody's just got to work harder. This is all about grace. Like this is centered in the message of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, his atonement for us. But that there's a synergy that we have to respond to that grace. And that requires running a race, like St. Paul said. So, you know, this is, this is good stuff. This is like biblical language. Yeah. Who, would, who would have thought Our Lady, would, or the mother of Jesus, would talk like the Bible? It's weird. Yeah, okay. So let's keep going. And we saw an immense light that is God. I'm wondering if it's still to the left of Our Lady. I'm thinking it probably is, because that's where mm. Jesus would be. And we saw an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. A bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. So we'll pause there. So they see an immense light that is God. This is sort of a, a finite way, I think, of seeing the beatific vision, right? Which is by the mystics is often referred to as a mirror. It's kind of, you know, I always use when I'm teaching on the beatific vision, I say, I say th- think of a giant movie screen that has no borders. It goes on infinitely. 
and you can look into it and you can see all things. That's like the, that's kind of like a very small understanding of the beatific vision. You're looking into the divine essence, which is infinite. There's no border, right? And that vision makes you happy. It makes you blessed. It's the beatific vision. So it's kind of this, again, a screen, a mirror. They're looking into it. There's light, an immense light that is God. And in this beatific vision that they're participating in, they see a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. What is this? Can we? Yeah, yeah let's stop. Can, let's pause. Yeah. Go ahead. So that, that's what we call conspicuous language. And there's no way you can get around it to say a bishop dressed in white. There's only one bishop ordinarily who dresses in white. And, but that's conspicuous prima facie. But then she even double, you know, offset, you know, comma offset, comma clause. And he says, we have the we had the impression that it was the pope. Completely ambiguous. I mean, she's not trying to be coy. She's just tell she's uh, Sister Lucy, remember, is a very honest, literal minded reporter. And she with that disposition she's reporting to us that we were she might still not have been sure you know whether or not it actually was a bishop who was the pope it's, well it's it seems to me that this phrase is it's not part of the vision because let me just read it again just no, think this of it grammatically this is this is her inserting a footnote so right here's how this it is goes. in her memoir something yeah. similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white, comma, we had the impression it was the Holy Father. And then she goes on to say, other bishops, priests. So it's, this is a parenthetical note she's placing in. Our Lady isn't revealing we had the impression it was the Holy Father. This is just her saying, when we kids saw this, I guess when they're talking about it later, hey, the guy in white, was that the Pope? And they said, well, we had the impression, but it wasn't for sure. Right. This comes from a, this is where it gets weird. Uh, yeah. This comes from her third memoir, right? Because we're, we're reading from her third. I forget how it works when we're actually reading the text. How? how yeah, that doesn't come. Well, I mean, from this the is video. released how, in 2000. This is released in 2000. This is how it comes to us, given officially by um, the Vatican. And it has this parenthetical comment, which is right. clearly in the first person is clearly Lucia saying we had the impression of the Holy Father. So it's really right. the only thing, it, as far as I can tell, in here that's sort of her making a comment. The rest of it is just she recounting what she saw. But here she's actually making a reflection upon what she saw. Nowhere right. else in here does, does she do that. Right. And I think it comes from a third memoir. I'm 80% sure. But so, oh, so that that's fine. Yeah, that's a good point. But let, let's just, I mean... I think everything, all the logic that I'm trying to draw out still obtains. It's like, it, what, what is this? Why, why would you, why would you make this, you know, appositional pause and say, we had the impression it was the Bishop. That's really, the really Father. important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Holy Father, um, that ends up being very important when the underwhelming three a is eventually revealed in 2000 right. we were like well was this was this john paul ii in 1981 right is it pope Again, benedict who still is a bishop dressed in white but isn't a pope right now right that's right. now on everybody's radar you know like right so i think timothy we can just say this is really odd and we don't know what it means but it's important sure. and i think sure. we can move on there's we could speculate yeah. a whole lot, but I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Yeah. So, so then yeah. Lucy says, other bishops, priests, men and women religious, going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father, now here she uses the word Holy Father. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step. Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Okay, so now we see a city, 50% is destroyed. Um, the Holy Father is leading this procession, bishops, priests, religious. 
and he's in pain. He's in sorrow and he's praying for the souls as there's corpses in the streets, corpse, they're unburied people. So something horrific has happened. And I'll I'll pause there and you can add, add your thoughts to that, Tim. Well, so one way or the other, either literally or figuratively, this requires a three B here. Here's why when when you try to apply three A, this, these words themselves, these images themselves to what was revealed in 2000. Here's, here's why literally, if you're a literalist in your interpretation of these words, yeah, then there, you know, what happened on May 13th, 1981 to JP2 being shot by, uh, 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 Aliaga. There, there weren't, no one else was shot. It wasn't, a, there were no other corpses, right? right. It, it, there, there's no middle way. You can't be part literal, part, part figurative. Yeah, he wasn't at going least up a sense. mountain. No mountain. Yeah. He was in no, a, he was in a no other con- He wasn't walking, right. leading a procession. Right. So if, if you're trying to say, if, if you're trying to, uh, fit a more literalist interpretation onto this as the, the, you know, Vatican has for now 18 years from 2000 to now, then this is a bad fit, literally, yeah, right? There's no because way this it, is 1981 assassination of JP2. No way. I, it's, it's very, very difficult. Now, if, there's nobody if, who really believes that. Really? Is there anyone I, out there who really believes that? No. Can we all say, yeah, it happened on May 13th. It has something to do with Fatima. Yeah, but is it this? No, it's ridiculous. But ooh, sure. But even then, uh, Aliaga knew he, he, he'd been told by someone about the third secret of Fatima or that, yeah. which is really odd. But but then so I, I agree with you. If you try to go a more figurative route. Right. And you say that, well, this part three A is really pointing at more figurative uh, theological truths. As they concern the world and the church. Well, then. That might be a little more honest, except in the sense that you're applying them in a real way to historicity with the uh, right. um, and then then you wind up back with with Ratzinger saying this involves the Novissimi. Well, how does the other uh, saying it has to do with Revelation 12 and, and JP2 saying it has to do with the dragon? Yeah. How do does the dragon and Novissimi and eschatology writ large have anything to do with JP2? They're unwilling to say so. Even that that might be a more honest route to say, right. look, this is broader and more theological than the interpretation that we've given. But on the broader theological tip, you have to go further and say it's a scatological it, at the very least. The 1980s, if not the assassination of JP two, the attempted assassination anyway. If it if it's not eschatological in itself, we are admitting that that the whole thing is eschatological. Neither way does it prop up the interpretation that they gave, since they gave it in terms of exclusivity. Right. It's you you can't take either route. Yep. So it, basically, what we're saying here is this is referring to something that has not yet happened. It wasn't yep. 1981. It wasn't John 23rd, Paul the sixth, JP one, JP two. Benedict, maybe Benedict, who knows? This is something, it's so radical that we can't pin it to anything that we've ever seen in the Catholic Church. Well, maybe JP1, but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I mean, that's a yeah. video. We should do a video right. on JP1. He met with her. Uh, a year. We should do a video yeah, on JP1. He right. met with her a year before. Yeah, I, I'll save JP1 it. JP1 but... coming, coming to a YouTube n- near you. Okay, so the, it goes on. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way, there died one after another, the bishops, the priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Right. Pause there. So he gets to the top. The city's half destroyed. He gets to the mountain. There's the cork cross. I've, I've, I honestly, I've thought it and prayed about what this cork cross means, and I don't know. I thought maybe when they're in Ireland, we'd find out, but no. <laughs> so yeah, there's, a yeah. cork, there's a cork cross, and it's while he's on his knees. There's a genuflection here. He's on his knees. He's killed by a group of soldiers, and the odd thing to me in this part is they fire bullets and arrows at him. 
So it's not just yeah. AK-47s or AR-15s. There's some crossbows or some some long bows involved in this. So which which everyone knows that happened on May 13th, 1981. Right. There are all these right. there's all this arrow fire. Yeah. No, that didn't happen. No. You know, what do you want from me? I mean, this is what I say to my friends who who are more mainstream on this is like, look, what do you want from me? He didn't fire arrows at her and no one else is dead. There's not like corpses all around and there's no court cross. What how you like astonish me. You just make me an argument, right. convince me. I, I, I'm not crazy. You know, I want to be mainstream sometimes. I almost never, never uh, fit there in, but I'd like to be, I'd like to get to that space. There's no arrows. What, yeah. what the hell, you know? Well, on the arrow part, I did a word study on the Old Testament and arrows <laughs> tend to be one of two things. Um, oh, you told me this. Yeah, yeah. First off is arrows are, pestilence or plagues coming from God himself. You see this also in Homeric literature. I'm going to read a line from the prophet Ezekiel. This is God speaking. He says, when I loose against you, my deadly arrows of famine, arrows for destruction, which I will loose to destroy you. And when I bring more and more famine upon you and break your staff of bread. So here God is saying, I'm going to punish Israel because of your infidelity. And I'm going to fire my deadly arrows, the arrows of famine and arrows of destruction. So that's one way arrows are used in prophetic language. The other way is in the other prophets and arrows are usually associated with the Babylonians and the Babylonian invasion of Judea and the destruction of Jerusalem. There's too hmm. many. I mean, just go online and search arrows in the old Testament. And then just, you know, I, Isaiah is, here's one of them. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows bent. Their horses hoofs seem like Flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. whirlwind. Um, with bows and arrows, men will come there. So they're talking about Jerusalem. So in Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these places, arrows is the judgment of God coming to Jerusalem, coming to the temple. So mm. why arrows? The only thing, you know, as, a, as Christians, I think we should look at, and we're talking about prophetic language, what's the prophetic role of arrows in the Bible? Um, they're a sign of judgment either coming directly from God or coming through agents that God has appointed to bring about the destruction of Jerusalem. Anything you want to add right. on that? Well, yeah, yeah. It just, it bulwarks the point that even if you want to take this as a mainstream defender of the, the third secret as revealed by the Vatican, you, you got to take it in this metaphorical direction. And the metaphorical direction is still not something they're comfortable with. It's still not right. happy, happy, nice, nice. That's it. What about everybody else dying, Tim? I mean, the bishops, the priests, the men and women religious. I mean, this seems like a full out destruction of the hierarchy. Right. You know, it, uh, is I anybody know. left? You know, where are the priests? Where are the bishops? You know, well, half half dead city. So uh, she doesn't go back to the half that are alive, but she says it's a half. I mean, so again, the literalist interpretation is out. And what, what again, we keep, not to bang a drum. But if you wanted to make this work for our times, which obviously it has to work for our times, because that's why she gave it. We're not saying it's not true. Right. It has to be metaphorical. It has to be theological. It has to relate to the no me doctrine under attack, dogma under attack, yeah. the church under attack. And it becomes more metaphorical. At least how you said a third using Revelation. Yeah. This Here would be half. half the priests are spiritually dead, apostatized. So, I mean, it could be. Well, it's two ways we could go here, Tim. We could say. Okay, these are martyrdoms, and these are saints. These are holy, uh, holy pope, who's a martyr, bishop martyrs, priest martyrs, religious martyrs, and we have seen the most martyrs of all time in the 1900s. So that does fit for us. We could also take it to a allegorical and say these are spiritually dead clerics. That's the more kind of radical anti-Vatican II. You know, we've got people leading the church up a mountain to the cross. But in a sense, God has them killed by these soldiers. Right. Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that these are this yeah. is a spiritual death? I mean, I kind of read it more as a martyrdom. Well, but but and the I reason mean, is the next line. I should read the next line, then we can debate. Go ahead. It. So so the bishops, the priests, and the religious and the people die, and then the very last line in the third secret, close the book according to uh, two thousand. 
beneath the two arms of the cross. This is the cork cross. Why is it cork? I don't know. It's weird. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with crisp crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. So it seems in this very last sentence, the souls that were making their way to God, that the mountain is the journey of salvation. Mm. Because there's other souls who are going to make this journey. And they're using the blood of these, and it says martyrs in the text. They're sprinkling them to somehow assist, cleanse, help, other Christian souls who are trying to make this mountain journey. Mm. So this is why I think that we can't say these are spiritually dead Pope, bishops, priests, religious lay. I think we need to see them as noble. That mm. doesn't mean, by the way, that the bullets and the arrows aren't the judgment of God. Right. Right. Yeah, not the necessarily. Ju- when the judgment of God visits Rome and converts Rome from pagan Rome to Catholic Rome, the Diocletian persecution creates thousands of martyrs right you know that that give their life shed their blood for christ it's really that blood that cleanses the city of rome from its idols Um, but that's still the judgment of god coming on rome it's just that the saints the disciples of christ are absorbing that wrath and re-offering it for sanctification right offering it up you know so that's my take and i i think these martyrs are good guys good women, good Pope. And I'm not sure. And honestly, there is a disjunction um, whether the original Bishop dressed in white is the same one here. It kind of seems like it is, but there is a disjunction in the, in the text. Right. So. um, Yeah. That last line makes it harder to dispute. I I I actually forget about the crystal aspersorium line. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That puts it beyond the the only, the only issue I have, I mean, I got no issue with that. It's, it's very interpretive and that seems to be a good interpretation, but most of the martyrs in the 20th century happened before I'm trying to think of the chronology. They happened before this would be relevant to us in the 1960s. Most of them happened uh, uh, you know, about World War One and Two. Yeah. Um, you know, we can of or concerning World Wars One and Two. I don't know. I don't know. But she's also saying it in 1917. She's right. also revealing this. And it's very. I mean, people can see even on, and this is what maybe people appreciate about our approach. There's nothing reductive or simple about this, right? I mean, even if you're like, uh, I mean, I think I basically get that. Yeah, the third why did secret, our lady give us this? You and I just went over in detail. We try to apply what we know from history, what we know from the Bible. Um, you know, like, why is it a crystal aspersorium? An aspersorium, by the way, is the bucket that the priest has holy water in, and he dips the asper, aspergium? What is that thing? Anyway, he dips the asparagus. Spring, yeah, he dips yeah. the asparagus in the bucket and walks around your parish. Hopefully you've seen this and had this happen to you. Happens in the high mass, in the old Latin yeah. mass. So they're carrying these buckets of holy water except they're not just buckets they're crystal and they have right. blood in them and they're sprinkling the blood right and that's so it. and you know in in vision one mary told us what it meant vision two she said hey i want russia consecrated here's what everything means world war etc here the next line should say something about uh and in portugal <laughs> you know right. the dogma of the faith let me help you out here uh, yeah. No. And by the way, and by the way, what what all the abstruse crystal aspersorium imagery means is really this. Let me give you the straight dope. And we don't get that. So even though I'm I'm 95 percent sure that that the, the the third secret has to do with, you know, the sweeping of the, the stars from heaven, the apostasy, the widespread apostasy by clergy in the church. Yeah, I. There's nothing simple about looking and tending to the particular images. There's not. And there's no need to pretend it is. We're missing. We're missing, I think, the second part of the third secret. Obviously, that's the working theory. So no one's going to. It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter how good an investigative journalist you are, like Antonio Sochi. 
everyone who knows enough about this knows that we just need we need more information. We need yeah. 3B. Yeah. I know basically what the, the bottom line is, I believe. I think you do, too. But but we, we want to know what 3B is. How does it all connect? You can only connect the dots afterward. Yeah. It's we need to petition. It's important also that Pope Benedict the 16th, before he resigned, he went on the record and he said this. This was, uh, well, May 11th, 2010. So a few years before he resigns, he says, quote, we would be mistaken to think that Fatima's prophetic message has been completely realized, end quote. So here it's very clear from Pope Benedict XVI that it is not a closed book. It's not, you know, the clowns in 2000 who says, hey, we've got Fatima under wraps. You know, that's a wrap. That's wrong. Benedict XVI says that the prophetic message of Fatima has not yet been completely revealed. We haven't seen a martyred pope. We haven't seen martyred bishops, priests, women religious, men religious. We haven't seen a city half in ruin, whether that's Rome, it's the city of God, the church. We haven't seen these things. And unfortunately, I think that we are going to see this. It's right. sorrowful. It's sad. It's going to be bad, people. It's going right. to be real bad. And just because you're a lay person doesn't mean you're not included because lay people are in this. Yeah, specifically. Yeah, Benedict, remember, had all these prophecies about the church returning to a mustard seed around the 21st right. century. A much smaller it's going to get church. Small. Smaller, tighter, more martyr-like church uh, of people that are uh, of, of more willing saints, not this super church. The bigger you make the club, the softer the rules get. That's 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 not just it supernatural have to be that way. But that seems to be the modus operandi right now. We don't want any division. We don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. As we saw in the youth synod, you know, Bla Cardinal Blaise Super says we don't want to use any language. That would make anyone feel, he or feel, feel excluded. Yeah. Well, you pretty I, much just chopped out most of Christ's words from the four canonical gospels at that point. Right. Right. You as a cardinal, right. as a bishop, successor to the apostle, can no longer use the words of the second person of the Trinity. Right. So that's a it's pretty exclusive. poor way of growing the church. Right. Agreed. Yep. So there it is. Third secret of Fatima, third secret controversy. Um, I think you've mentioned it so many times, Antonio Sochi's book, The Fourth Secret, is a go-to so manual. So good. It's very yeah. balanced. It's not going to have a lot of crazy, you know, whack stuff. No crazy whack stuff. Yeah. It's, it's and, no, and no wild condemnations of anyone aside from you know, Bertoni and, 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 uh, Sedano don't like what he's saying, but he's not even, he's not even hellfire and brimstone with respect to them. Yeah. It's really good. Go on and get him to read the it. Facts. Yeah. yeah. I'll put the image yeah. on the screen there. And, uh, well, this has been great. Thir uh, three secrets of Fatima, really the, f the one secret in three parts. If you haven't seen one and two, go back, you'll see the playlist. You can uh, listen to all of them in sequence. If you like these, hit the subscribe button. When you hit the subscribe button, you'll see a little bell. Click the bell. That will notify you every time we put out more uh, videos on Catholic church events, theology, Marian topics, all kinds of stuff. So uh, everybody, thanks for watching. Timothy, thanks for all of your, your thoughts and your analysis. Appreciate it. Everybody, God Thank bless. You. Our Lady God Fatima, bless. pray for us.